right? Matthew 10, starting in verse 24. I just titled this one. There it is. What does a disciple look like? We're going to talk about discipleship throughout these verses. A lot of things in the gospel talk about sonship, but after becoming sons, then we become disciples. You know, I, uh, I learned how to play Scrabble at a very young age with my Aunt Dorothy. I would go to the country and, man, she hardly had anything. I think they lived on a pension of about $300 a month. And she always had food, she always had entertainment, even if it was Scrabble. Aunt Dorothy was quite competitive. I never beat Aunt Dorothy. And, man, she was always sweet to me, though. She was mean to my dad playing games because she was so competitive. Sweet to me, though. And uh, so... I never, I never won a game against her, but I learned how to play that. By the way, I just kind of think of my little story analogy I come up with, and I reckon that anyone under 25 might not know what I'm talking about. Does anyone not know what that game is? Not a, yeah, yeah. I, I looked at that section for a reason. Not that that's a big part of the message. I was just wondering, though. And uh, so it's, it's a game of bringing together these wooden tiles with letters uh, with a, with one letter on each tile and they're just disarray they're all over the place in in just this mess and and so you have 26 letters in the alphabet but you have more tiles than that because you have duplicates of common letters like e and and a and things like that and, and so you might have 70, 80 tiles, which doesn't seem like a lot. Very small little tiles, but you know what? They will, you can spell every word in the dictionary with them. The game involves the ordering of these letters, which they have no order at all. But there are already words... You know, words exist, and so you have this mess that gets in order to display something that already exists. You have letters on the tiles, so you place them down, and you make words. That's the goal in the game. I mean, there's a score, which Aunt Dorothy always had the high score, But the goal in the game is to take this jumble of stuff and make it make sense according to something that already exists, okay? Now, Christians becoming disciples, being discipled, has to do with our lives and our actions being performed, being lived in such a way that that the actions come together to, to give us a picture of something that already exists. God's salvation. It already exists. It exists in us. And, and the more we're discipled, the more clearly that it can be seen, this gift of salvation for the Christian. The goal of being discipled and living the Christian life is to arrange our lifestyle in such a way that we look like the existence of someone who has been saved by God's grace. What does a disciple look like, though? 
is the question, and we're going to answer that in some ways tonight. I would like for us to see a picture through the instructions of Jesus about six, about six sets of instructions that will give us a picture of what a disciple looked like then. And by this timeless word, it is what a disciple is going to look like today. So look with me in verses 24 and 25. And let us, let us picture by some instructions here that the disciple anticipates suffering. Verse 24, the disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master, and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household. Our Lord, our Master, He suffered when He walked this earth. He was persecuted. He was lied upon. He was slapped. He was spit upon. He was beat with, with such old antique tools that it ripped the flesh from His body. He took stripes for us. Going back, he, he had unjust trials where he was lied against and falsely accused. This is our Lord and this is our Master. And if we are going to be discipled, if we're going to be disciples, we're never going to outrank our Master, okay? So as a pupil of the Lord... As a student of our suffering master, will we not suffer also? Now, now the Christian, someone who's a child of God, who has not been discipled, they might curl up in fetal position and, and, and just want to sleep the world away because suffering comes their way. But let us see the picture through instruction here. That the Christian is to anticipate it. If our Lord went through suffering, we are going to also. Let us anticipate suffering as we're growing in a disciple because that's what's going to happen. Brother George brought a real encouraging, an encouraging word about suffering Thursday night at the villas, Romans chapter 5, how tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. So there is, he said there's fruit from our suffering. I, I never said it that way. Maybe a lot of people have, but I really liked it. Our suffering bears some fruit, but and it's something it's, that's going to happen. We should count it a privilege to suffer with our Lord. Paul wanted to because he wanted to know Him better. So what does the disciple look like? Well, picture this. A child of God who anticipates suffering. But also one who acknowledges the light. To be honest with you, as I looked here... I, I thought this might be a point that I wasn't as excited about as the others. But the more I just thought about it, the more I drove down the road or doing whatever, thinking about this point, let me just get to it. Look, verse 26. Fear them not, therefore. Though Those who would cause our suffering, those who would uh, bring persecution against us. Fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid that should not be 
known. Verse 27. What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light. And what ye hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. There is so much opposition to the Christian by the enemies of the gospel. And it it comes around in very deceptive ways. It can be this this opposition can sometimes be very indirect. You know, you you may have had opposition come against you from someone who might even profess that they're right with God, someone on the job. And, 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 and so they, they want to take that stance, so they're very indirect in the way that they criticize your Christianity. Has anybody ever been there? It's a behind-the-scenes, indirect way of opposition to the people of God. What's the difference in the Christian and the disciple? What's the difference in a child of God who would become hindered and stunted by this and, and the disciple who presses on right through it? Well, first of all, the disciple's actions, the function of the disciple, a disciple of the Lord is wide open before all. There's nothing to hide when our lives are in the will of God. And we're wide open and and serve and courageous and, and, and serving the Lord. And we walk in the words that we witness with. Our walk and our talk lines up. Living as a disciple gives us nothing to hide. The false witness really hides everything. The false witness lies. Just as I mentioned about Jesus a minute ago, the false witness lied about Jesus and His trials. They were at the wrong time. There were, th- there were so many things that were unlawful about it, but they lied about it. They tried to lie about, uh, at the sepulcher about Him. And what took place there? But God saw to it that the truth came out. I hope this is making some kind of connection personally in our lives as disciples. And we we really picture this here. The disciple presses along serving through deception, through lies, because the Lord is a revealer of secrets. Because the Lord is going to bring to light those things that are wrong. The disciples knowing this as the disciple moves along serving the Lord. The Lord reveals the secrets of men's hearts. God is going to expose and judge all matters. So do you see the disciple Continuing on, not being hindered, not falling to the left or falling to the right, because they can acknowledge the light. They can acknowledge that light is going to be brought to a situation and the truth is going to be known. Romans 2.16 says, In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to to my gospel. We are not to fret. We are not to be frightened by the opposition of others because God is going to cast light at judgment. So the disciple is moving on in the will of God without secrets, without anything to hide, knowing That God's going to bring to light those things that have been said, those things that have been done. Let's also look at 
a disciple by way of a disciple having an aimed fear. Verse 28. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Our fear is not aimed at man. The disciple, what is a disciple pictured as? Not, no fear of man. We don't fear man. If, if man kills the body, we go to be with the Lord. I heard a story, don't know if it's a true story or not, but one man pulled a gun on another, and the man who had the gun pulled on him was a Christian. And as the story goes, that Christian said, it sure is hard to threaten a man with heaven. A true story on the news some years back, you can look up the video and you can watch the clip of the news. There's a guy that jumped into an elderly lady's car. She might have been mid-80s or something like that. And I'm 99% sure he had a gun. Look up the video and see. Don't, don't ask me what to punch in. Just, you got to find it. But... Pretty sure he had a gun. He got in the car and he said, give me your money. And that lady, I, I, can, I can hear her voice and watching that video. And as calm as she can be, she said, if you pull that trigger on that gun, I'm going to go to heaven. And in your condition, it looks like you might be someone that would be going to hell. You know what happened as a story goes from from the lady tears in in just a outpouring rainfall down his face and he didn't rob her he melted he got all sappy and before he left she gave him ten dollars and she said here you go now don't go spend that on alcohol sonny An aim to fear. Our fear is aimed at God. We fear God. When we fear God, we fear no one else. We fear God and God only. Now talk about destruction. Talk about hurt. Talk about killing. God's the one who can impose real destruction He can destroy both body and soul in hell. Not that the child of God fears hell. Not that we could go to hell. We couldn't. The old country preacher said we couldn't even if we wanted to. We're sealed in Christ. The Lord will never condemn His children. But the person who fears the Lord does not ever need to fear man. The fear of God will cancel all other fear. And let's look at that as we continue on. Let's look at all fear in verses 29 through 31. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall to the ground without your father. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. Why is it that we can picture the disciple with all fear being dismissed except for that aimed fear of God? Well, he talks about the sparrows here. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? You know what that means? Sparrows are cheap. You could buy them cheap. It, it said that, that they would even throw in another sparrow if you went to buy a sparrow. It was the, the poor man's bird, a common bird. And yet, for one to fall, God is there to take care of of that bird. 
are you not much better than the birds? Our worth, our value is much more than that of the birds. Luke 12, 16, that's where it says that are not five sparrows sold for a farthing and not one of them is forgotten before God. That's what it says in Luke 12, 6. If God cares this much for the birds, how can we be a disciple with no fear? Let us clearly understand what Jesus wants us to know, and that is that He cares for us. We're of much more value than they are. When we fear God and have His care, all other fear can be gone. How about this for a picture of a disciple all surrendered? Verses 32 and 33. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, listen to what it says. Listen to what Jesus says. Him will I also deny before my Father, which is in heaven. Remember, we're not talking about sonship. We're talking about discipleship. We're not talking about salvation here. We're talking about rewards. A lot of people have tried to take this out of context and mean it to speak of something that it's not talking about at all. So, so the picture here is of the disciple being all surrendered. Because what we have here is more than the thought of a confession with words. What does he say? Um, um, where are we at? 32. Whosoever... Therefore shall confess me before men. Him will I confess before my Father. This is a whole lot more than spiritual words. It's about a spiritual walk. Is what we're talking about. It's not. It has so much little to do with an audible statement. But all to do with being surrendered to Jesus Christ. You know, it's one thing to say that He is our Lord. It's another thing to obey Him as Lord. You can picture the disciple, a disciple saying He's Lord. But for the disciple, you also picture an obedience. An obedient life surrendered to God. This is to be a walk by the disciples, backed up by a talk. And Jesus has set us up to be able to be discipled that you and I might have this walk with Him. I've been talking about Jesus at Reunion Court. Christ our Savior. Christ our Redeemer. Christ our Great High Priest. Christ our our advocate, and so on, and so on. Jesus Christ is our great high priest to give us grace in time of need. Jesus is our advocate for the forgiveness of sins as He is at the right hand of the Father to cleanse us continually, we can be all surrendered to Jesus because He has set things up to save us and to disciple us and everything He is to us and everything He's done for us is so that we can continue on unhindered, not unfazed, but the disciple never has 
an excuse, a reason, whatever we would want to call it, why we can't and why we wouldn't serve the Lord. We can't do everything we've always done, but there's always something that the disciple is doing to serve God. He keeps us going. He doesn't depend on our faithfulness. He's the one who will always be more faithful to us than we are to Him. I don't don't think anyone's going to abuse that. And so so let's let's just soak that in for just a minute. Because that will help us with the everyday fret of life in a walk with the Lord. We are never going to be as faithful to Him as He is to us. The disciple learns to depend. The disciple sees that our determination only goes so far and we learn to depend upon Him. We can't do it without Him. The disciple sees it. And at the same time, we can see that we're all, we, we can be all surrendered to Him. Let me say this about our faithfulness. Benefits and blessings do come to the faithful. God blesses us with reward. He, he blesses us from the blood work of Christ on the cross. And this is what verse 32 means. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. Well, he's, well, well, every child of God has an advocate, a great high priest in Jesus, and every child of God is going to heaven. He's got some special rewards for faithfulness. Verse 33, let us understand this then. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. There are certain graces and benefits, rewards that we'll come up short of when we get to heaven. What, what's a part of these certain graces? Well, I just said it. L- rewards. Listen, listen to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10, which says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And what is this for? That everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. If any man's work shall abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive of a reward. If any, if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So there's reward and there's lack of reward. Listen to 2 John verse 8. Look to yourself, look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. You see, the disciple has his heart and his mind on this, not that our focus is rewards, but what did Jesus say? Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. This is about reward. It's not about salvation. Peter denied the Lord. And Peter wasn't an unsaved person that got saved. It's not possible to be saved again. So it's, it's not like some kind of additional profession was made. And he wept bitterly. The Lord knew his heart over the situation. And then after Jesus' resurrection, 
Jesus says, tell my disciples to come. He doesn't, he doesn't list them by name. Tell my disciples and Peter. He comforted Peter. He loved Peter. Peter was a saved man. Peter denied the Lord, but Jesus called him and called him specifically. He may have lost something. He may have lost something that he was going to gain for, for that, but he was sure comforted and drawn in personally by the Lord. He was affirmed in the Lord's love. Look what he went on to be. Man, there's something about being affirmed in the Lord's love. To, you know, when we are being discipled, then the Lord gives us something to do. How, how affirming is that when the Lord gives us a position of service for Him? How about the Apostle John? When Jesus took time out from dying to say, take care of my mama. How wonderful it is to be in awe of the love of the Lord Jesus for us. What did John call himself? The disciple whom Jesus loved. Amen. All surrendered. This is a picture of a blessed, fully re rewarded disciple. And then let's look at uh, let's look at a disciple at odds. I'll call this verse thirty four through thirty nine. Think not that I am come to send peace on the earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Well, you can see that one sometimes. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household." He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. Wow, a picture of a disciple. You know, we seem to have the idea that a Christian living in the will of God is just going to get along well with everyone and everything is going to be just peachy. And don't get me wrong, the Bible does say that, that even our enemies can be made to be at peace with us. But... Once we're identified with Christ, we're in a war. Jesus says, I came not to send peace, but a sword. Look, everyone could have peace with Jesus. If everyone would receive Jesus, everyone would have peace with Jesus and with one another. But there are those who receive Jesus... And there are those who reject Jesus. So, since there are always acceptors and rejectors of Christ, the only way that the disciple, I mean a will of God Christian, a disciple, the only way to avoid comp, uh, conflict is to compromise and to deny Christ. To, to not wear your faith to where others can see. That's the only way not to be at odds. But this would put us at war with the Lord if we did that. And so we see the standing. We see that standing for the Lord will always put us at odds. And look... I, even with those closest to us. 
We read, we read about some family members here. At odds with those we love who are close family. At odds, as I use here, doesn't mean we are to allow our witness to be ruined, though. You know, some say it's so hard to witness to family. Well, it's not as hard as we make it out to be. The Lord, the Lord wants our example to be before others, to be before those closest to us. But we love and we care for them and we share Jesus with them and we get so passionate and we've prayed so long that, that isn't it kind of easy to get frustrated? You know, it, it's easy to show our frustration more with those we're close to, with those that we love the most. I'm not saying it's okay, but it's easy to do. But we're not to ruin our witness over a loved one's soul. You know, it can seem like we care about our own loved ones who are unsaved, our own family members who are unsaved, more than they care about themselves. Kind of like when, when the farmer was trying to get his cow back in the pasture. And, and he's out there trying to herd that cow in. And he almost starts crying over this cow because he, he loves his animals. And he says, don't you see that I'm trying to help you? And that cow just won't, he just won't come back in the, in the pasture. And that's the way we can feel about family. And we can let frustration get the best of us. But what, what, what are we to do as a disciple? We're, we're, to, we're to absorb it. We're to suffer for Jesus. We're to suffer for righteousness sake. There's going to be an offense to the cross. But we shouldn't be unnecessarily offensive as, as disciples. The disciple can be pictured as as immaturity, not not being offensive, though standing for the Lord. You know, our life is to be a sacrifice. A disciple becomes selfless. We lose when the interest is in self. We lose if we can't take what even the family member would say to us about our Lord and about our witness and about what we say about our Lord. The winner is the one who dies daily, who lives for the Lord's interest first and not our own interest. That will cause us to absorb. That will cause us to sacrifice. The disciple dies to self and lets Christ win the battle. The disciple shares the gospel and leaves the power of the gospel there as a seed planted, a seed watered. And the interest is in Christ, not self. Let's look at verses 40 and 42 and let's close this up and let's look at anything. A picture of a disciple and anything that is done in the will of God. He that receiveth you receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. He that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water only... In the name of a disciple, verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. Not everyone will reject the Lord. There will be those who receive the Lord. I tell you what, after being saved, and this isn't just for the preacher when he's preaching, this is for every Christian to share the truth of Jesus Christ and have some, someone before your very presence accept the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. 
I can't even put a number to it. I could, I could say it's worth knocking on 250 doors for that one to be saved. Or for that one just to come to church and then three months later in church, for whatever reason, that's the time that they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's, it's worth it. There are blessings for being a blessing to others. It's not automatic though. There's an attitude that the disciple is going to have. Attitude is important. A right spirit secures a reward in anything done for God's glory. You know, we can't just do and we can't just function. We, we can't just do what we're supposed to be doing. A right attitude is so important. And we need help. We need help with that. So thank God for a unified church. Only by the grace of God I could leave with such a right attitude today. The people of God lifted me up. And we lift one another up. And we, man, we need, we need so much help. And the Lord is our help. But He helps us through one another too. How, how, how good and how sweet it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Giving a cup of cold water with a proper attitude gives the return of a reward. You know, it's one thing to have sonship. There's scripture we can talk about for that. It's another thing when we grow into being a disciple. That, that's what we all ought to be doing here. Disciples making disciples. We ought to be busy with, with one, with five, with seven other Christians. In the church, disciples making disciples. And we see what a disciple looks like here. How do we, how do we know? How do we know what a, Christ, what a disciple looks like? Well, that Christian is going to be anticipating suffering. Acknowledging the light. Don't, don't get all balled up over this and that. And so and so got away with this. And, and they got away with that. Who gets away with anything with God? He brings everything under the light. The disciple, picture the disciple with an aimed fear. With all fear dismissed because of fear in God. All being surrendered. The disciple's going to be at odds. In the will of God, living for the Lord Jesus Christ, identified in Him, there's going to, we're going to be at odds. With, with someone or something. And how about just anything? How about anything in the right attitude, in the will of God? Bringing about a blessing. Bringing about a reward for the, reward for the people of God. Even a cold cup of water. I heard a sermon, Cold Water Christian, one time. And uh, it kind of, that was years and years ago, kind of introduced me to that truth. Praise God for not just being saved, but us becoming a disciple. I, I don't know what might be on your heart during a time of an invitation. Maybe it's another Christian who you know invested in your life. The Lord led them to invest in your life. And it helped you to grow. It helped you to become a disciple. As a matter of fact... I'll even ask for that testimony right now. Is there anyone with a testimony before we close about that? Ryan. I think having an outlet like I do uh, with the Timothy team. Oh, if you want me to. Okay, I'll get there. <laughs> I, I think having an outlet uh, like I do with the uh, Timothy team, which is just a collection of guys who get around and talk about uh, their plans for what they want to do in the church and uh, for how they want to, you know, uh, put forth God's great commission, having an outlet like that and having a couple friends, uh, and really just talking about it, and I'll put the I'll put it in layman's terms, you know, one to one, 
uh, you know, as a friend talks with another is very helpful, and that's how I've uh, developed, I would say. Amen. Someone else. Someone else after Seth. Brother uh, Mike, this guest that came to Lakeway for a little while, um, he he went soul winning. He's actually the one that basically led me to the Lord. And then he uh, told me to like, memorize scriptures and also to uh, read the word of God and listen to this guy named Alexander Scorby. And uh, that's what I did. And I've actually increased a lot of knowledge because of that. And I've read through the Bible, uh, New Testament a bunch of times and the Old Testament working on it. Amen. Amen. Someone else. Anybody else? Teenagers having a ball back there. No, you don't. As a disciple, for five years she came to this church. Amen. She would come home and tell me, hey, Pastor, Stone said to tell you hi. And I never came to church. And the Lord brought me to church. And I didn't like the music. I didn't like the pastor. I came home, drive home with her, grumbling about the church. And look what the Lord did to us. Wow. Praise God. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, please don't, please don't leave here tonight before grabbing someone here that would love to share Jesus with you. We we have we have four at least four, we have four deacons here tonight, and we have youth leaders, and we have men and women, anyone who would love to talk to you about Jesus. That's your invitation. We're going to close in prayer. Uh, Corey Farr, please word our prayer, sir. God bless you all tonight.